For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. He goes on in verse 17, he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Basically saying we have this message and the gospel is still alive and it's still powerful and it still changes lives today. The need is that we present the gospel and we continue to share Christ. So I dealt with that last week, and I want to talk a little bit more about that this week. And remember, we talked about two important points last week. One was this responsibility that we had. He says, you know, I'm a debtor. Now, we, we dealt with this, so I won't spend a lot of time with it this week, but it is clear that there's nothing that you or I can do to pay for our salvation. If we understand the theological ramifications of man and his sin nature, then it is impossible for a sinner to atone for his sins because he is a sinner. It's in his nature. If he were to offer even himself as a gift for his sins, it would not satisfy because that offering is stained with sin. It had to be a righteous offering to atone for sin, and only one could do that, that God's son. We're debtors, and not to pay, again, for my salvation. I can't do it. But I think it's this debt of love. When I first and truly got a glimpse in my own heart of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my sin, it revolutionized my life. I'd heard it all my life, been under conviction about it at different times in my life, but there came a day when I clearly understand that the cross of Jesus Christ was for me. And I saw the Savior bleeding and dying on that cross, suffering in my place. How do you pay that back? You cannot. You can't atone for that. You can't pay for that. God's love did that for you. That's how much God cares for you. Now, since I cannot pay it back, I, I, I owe one thing, and that's just to love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my body, my strength. I love God. It's a debt of love, and that's the debt that we all owe. In fact, even in, later in the book of Romans, Paul writes to the church, says, Owe oh, no man anything but love. So we have this debt of love. We want to, as God so loved the world, we should carry his same passion because he now lives in us that we so love this lost world that we're willing to take on this same kind of mindset and this same kind of attitude the apostle had to say, hey, God loves the world, then we love the world. And we love the world, and we love the world just for the same reason. God so loved us, hey, we would not love God if he hadn't loved us first, as John said. But now that we love God, we love the things that God loves, and God loves lost people. And the church has somehow got to come back to the place to have a passion and to have a burden for people who do not know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior. That's our message. That's our, that's our, that's our reason for living. The Bible says we're not saved nor redeemed with the blood of bulls and sacrificial animals, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We serve the Lord. How? We share the message. We continue to proclaim the message, the gospel that literally is the power to change people's lives. And it still has the same power to transform each and every life. He said, so this is my responsibility. But then he talked about, he said, listen, I'm ready to tell and to share and to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm ready. Now, last week, I talked about this word ready in the Greek language. It's the word prothumos, and it has to do with a passion. I mean, almost with a fierceness of breathing, as if, as if in breathing hard, ready, on the edge, waiting, you know, with an anticipation to, to, to get into, to get into the, to, the, to the program of God's purposes and, and God's will. I can't wait. I'm ready. I'm excited. The, the, one, the, uh, Jeremiah who said, listen, he said, it's like a, a fire that burns within me. Another uh, prophet and preacher of the gospel says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Why? Because I will burst if I don't. There's this attitude, and this is this word, I'm ready. There's this, this anticipation that I've been given this, this pearl of great price. I've been given this tremendous message of the gospel, and God has given it to me, and now I can in turn share that with the world, and I can see their lives transformed. I can see literally people's lives changed as a result of the message that I would share with them. I'm ready. Well, how, how do you get to that point? See, I want to be ready. I want that kind of anticipation. I want that kind of a positive anxiety, right? That, that I'm anxious to, to go out and to be used by God. I, the chomping at the bits mindset. You know, I, I want to be like that, Pastor. That's my desire. Well, I would hope that each and every one of us that do know the Lord Jesus personally would have that kind of anticipation, that kind of hunger to be ready like that. 
Well, let me give you a little four-point definition of what it means to be ready. The first is this word. What's that word? All right. Now, that's not a popular word anymore. In fact, I, I know of preachers and I've read materials and been to conferences where pastor says we shouldn't use these words because these words are offensive or people don't understand these words, so we should not use words that people don't understand. And there's been a real emphasis in churches today to remove a lot of words or theological terms. And the result of it, I believe, has been a dumbing down of the church. In fact, it was George Barner recently released an article that said 90% of evangelical pastors won't use words, theological words anymore, because they've been told not to, and, and, and nor will they deal with, with issues that are important in our culture right now. They won't talk about homosexuality. They won't talk about premarital sex. They won't talk about alcohol. They won't talk about abortion. You know, this, now I can understand 9%, but 90%? Doesn't that freak you out? Yes. Now, if you're a member in a regular Tender Believers Fellowship, you know, that, that doesn't doesn't relate to you because we deal with truth no matter how it comes across, the positives, the negatives. The truth is truth. You, you preach the truth. I mean, and, and you share the truth without apology. But to think that 90% of the churches this morning won't deal with important issues of the culture, the very things that seem to be undermining the, morale, the moral fiber of our nation, we're not going to talk about those because it would hurt the crowd or offend somebody. Well, we've definitely gotten way off course in our nation. We need to come back and just act like saved people. We are saved, amen? Don't be ashamed of that word, saved. Use it wherever you go where people don't know what it means. That's why you use it. So they'll ask you what it means. Hey, I'm saved. You saved? What's that mean? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because I'll tell you what, what that means. I'm saved. I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from the misery of a life without God. I'm, I'm saved from myself and from sin. I'm saved to heaven. I'm saved to God. I'm saved to life. I'm saved. Don't be ashamed of the word. It's a good word. Let's say it with me. Save. I didn't hear that one more time. Say. Save. Save. The old song you sing. Saved by his power divine. Saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete because I'm saved. Save. Little louder. Save. Hey, all right. Give yourself a hand. That's pretty good. Some of you are way off key, but that's okay. <laughs> At least you're saved. Amen. <laughs> saved. It's a good term. We use it. But that's the first prerequisite for being ready, because if you're not saved, you're certainly not ready. If you've not experienced new life in Christ, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're short of this element of salvation. I don't have any problem with Billy Graham's statistic when he said that he believed that 80% of Southern Baptist church members and many evangelical church members uh, were, didn't know Christ, had never been born again. All right? So we wonder why 80% of the church would not share Christ with the lost world, because they don't know Christ. I found out... It's easy to talk about somebody I know. It's easy to give witness to something I've experienced. You know, and the worst thing is for, to hear people who don't know anything they're talking about talk about it. Now, that happens all the time in the media. I know that. And we experience that on every level. But the truth of the matter is to be saved, you know, means that your life has been changed. You're not what you used to be. The, the whole definition of what it means to be a Christian is if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, old things pass away, all things become new. You've, you've been changed. What happened? I got saved. I'm a new person. I'm, I'm not what I used to be. Therefore, I'm this, this new individual who knows Christ, and I, I, I am saved, so I have, a, I have a message. But not only that, this word separated. Now, separated is, is a word that's found in Romans chapter 1 also, and it's the first verse where it says something like this. I, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, separated unto the gospel. Now catch that. He didn't say, because what we think of is this other way. He did not say, I'm separated from. He said, I'm separated unto. Now, a lot of Christians have this trouble from what's over here in leaving stuff and getting from that to something. And many times they're busy kind of looking over their shoulder to see, you know, what's behind them or longing for the old life or saying, well, I don't get, a, I wish I could do that now and I can't do that. And they're always kind of moving kind of direction forward, but still with an eye over the shoulder. If you embrace the biblical mindset that Paul is talking about here when he says, I'm saved unto something, we'll forget about what's behind me and I'll start looking at what's before me. If you're preoccupied with the past, it's because you're not preoccupied with the present and the future. 
And what we need to do is to get our heart and our mind and all the things that we are been called unto now. Now I have life. Now I have joy. Now I have peace. Now I have victory. Now I have an answer. Now I have a solution. Now I have grace. Now I have God. All right? So I should, I should, that, those things that I'm talking about, what I can't do anymore, but I'm pouting about, they pale in comparison to what I have. So maybe it's time to kind of turn the neck a little bit. <laughs> Quit looking at what's behind as the apostle said, I forget about those things that are behind me and I press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I'm headed under something. I'm going to something. So there needs to be separation though. I cannot share this message in power or with conviction if I'm just like the rest of the world, all right? And I know there's that popular theme in churches even that we want to be like the world and show them we are like them so they'll listen to us. It's not in conformity that anybody listens to anything. It's in uniqueness that people listen to something. Something's different about me. Something's unique about my life. The people I used to run with saw the change radically in my life. The people I used to, to spend my time with saw the difference that took place in my life. And there's, there's this, you, now I, I am not what I used to be. Now I know we're living in a generation, and this is kind of from the 60s, I guess, from hippie days, where everybody wanted to be different, everybody wanted to be unique. And, but listen, there's too many other people trying to be unique like that, all right, in 20 minutes. So, so we do all kinds of things in our culture, from piercing and tatting and all the other stuff, and painting our hair pink and purple and green, to, you know, because I'm a unique individual. If you want to be unique, give your life to God. Give your life to Christ. Get on fire for Jesus. Ain't nobody like you around. <laughs> Amen. Be unique. You be that unique person that God wanted you to be, not what the world says. But you know, it, it, they think that I'm just an individualist. When you're just like everybody else, it's like you've been put out of a cookie cutter somewhere. Be what God called you to be. Find out who that is. Get dis discover on. If you want some self realization, you'll find it in Christ Jesus, or who He made you to really be. And until then, it's just a futile search. But if I try to be like everybody else, they're not going to listen to me. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody trying to tell somebody else about Jesus and those people just walk away from that person, they say something, I'm not listening to him because he's just like me. Because they're not necessarily talking about your, light, your, your hairstyle or your tattoos. They're talking about your behavior. Your behavior has to change. There has to be a separation. You know, it's like if you... If you're, we, we, how many times, it's endless times we've said, if, if, you, you know, if your, your walk doesn't match your talk, then zip your lip, right? So if, if you're not willing to embrace a changed life, don't be talking about a changed life. You're not going to reach anybody without a changed life. You might get religious, but that's not what we're headed for, which leads me to the third element of this whole thing. It's surrendered. Because it is possible to be religious and to be separate and not to cuss and chew and smoke and all the other stuff everybody else does, you know, that we, we identify as worldliness and ungodliness. And, you know, you can be, you can, you, can, you can clean up your life, all right? But that doesn't mean you're surrendered. And all, that, all it really means is you got religious. There's a lot of people who don't do what the rest of the world does. And by that, they're different. But the unique element is still missing. That unique element where you get surrendered to God. That unique element now where Christ is in control of your life hasn't happened. And all you do is you become, well, I don't do X, Y, and Z anymore, therefore, what am I? Religious. You know, Christians, it, what, we're, what this is all about is not following some religious uh, moral code of ethics, all right? That's not what it's about. It's about a changed life. So if all we get is just don't do that anymore, and now I'm, I'm, you know, I've straightened up my, my walk and my words and I don't cuss and all that stuff anymore. So what do you got? Well, you end up in that same crowd that Jesus rebuked so often called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were extremely religious people. But remember what he said to them. He said, you're a bunch of vipers. You're full of dead men's bones. You're like a whited sepulcher. You're like a grave. It may be covered with flowers and painted well, and you may have some nice monuments on it, but still what's in the grave is dead men's bones. He said, you know, he said, that, that's that group that he rebuked more than anybody else. Religious. Why? Because what's missing? A heart for God. Reality. Commitment to Christ. Surrender to Jesus Christ. That's, that's what's missing. So before you pat yourself on the back for all those things you don't do anymore, are you surrendered to Christ? 
Have you given up your, your will to the Father? Have you surrendered to his desires and his purposes for your life? The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, he said, we now live a life that is worthy. We have a manner of life that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. So my life has changed, but now I'm, I'm surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what has to happen in our life. Genuine brokenness before God, where now he's really in charge of my life. Now, what happens as a result of that is this fourth element of what I believe is to be really ready to be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's kind of like dominoes, you know. First of all, you give your life to Christ. Now you're leaving the, the world as you're pursuing Jesus because that's what you have to leave the world to get to him because it's what repentance is. It's a change of direction, a change of mind, a change of course of your life. So now you turn to Christ and you're starting to move away and your life is now obviously different. But then God starts working in your heart as you surrender to Christ. And then you're surrendering to his filling and to his Holy Spirit as he works in your life. Now, we don't talk a lot in some churches today about being filled with the Spirit. But that's a very important principle in the life of a believer if you're going to be, one, a bold witness, and two, if you're going to be a victorious Christian. God never created you and then recreated you in Christ, gave you new life as a believer, and asked you to live that life that he's called us to live, this biblical pattern of living, without power in your life. Because you can't do it without power. You need the power of God. You can only be religious so long, all right? You can only be good so long. You need the Holy Spirit. This whole thing of Christianity really is an impossible kind of life. And so to discover the possibility for that, for me, is only, and for you, is going to be found in surrendering to Jesus' lordship and leadership in your life daily and to allow his Holy Spirit. You see, when you came to Christ, the Bible says you were sealed and you received the fullness of the Godhead. In Colossians, it says that you are complete in Christ Jesus, right? Well, how, how did I make complete? Well, if you read the passage, you're complete in Christ Jesus, that in Christ Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And now he lives in you. And now since you have Jesus, who has the fullness of the Godhead bodily in him, and he's in you, guess what you have? You have everything you need. You have God's fullness now abiding and residing in you. We used those passages from 1 Corinthians last week. We talked about you now, your, your body is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right? When did that happen? Now, there's a lot of controversy about this and a lot of avenues, and it may be your background, and I'm not trying to, to uh, mess up on your party, but I think more important than our denominational training and our particular backgrounds is, is that we find out what does the Bible teach about this? What, what does Scripture say? And to do that, you have to do more than just pick a verse, because you can go to something like Acts 2.38 and you can form a lot of doc, different doctrines. There's been two or three denominations started out Acts 2.38, and they all believe something different, all right? But you have to have more than one Bible verse, all right? Because there's, this, you, you, there's something very unique about the Word of God. It builds upon itself. It expounds upon itself. It, 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 it tells more about what it means in itself. It's, it's self-explanatory. It's not for my private interpretation. In other words, if I want to know what the Bible means in a particular verse, I read more of the Bible. And I discover what the Bible is teaching. And if I want to have this new life in Christ, and I want to experience the fullness of it, then I will have to live a life where I am filled with the Spirit. In Acts, the Bible tells us Jesus is giving those last of the marching orders to his disciples, which are ours as well. He says, you receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the world. So he wants us to be a witness. Where? Everywhere. Well, how am I going to do that? I can't do that without God's power. I'll receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, when's that going to be? Well, Brother Joe, that happened in the book of Acts. It happens every day. This morning, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you can be his witness and you can follow him and he'll give you his power today in this room. It happened to me the day I gave my life to Jesus. Now, I know there are people who try to teach that as a secondary and a second kind of thing that you want you, you know, you first of all, and you get Jesus. And then a little bit later, when you understand it more clearly and you're in the right service in the right place with the right person and you do the right thing and you manifest the right stuff, then you'll receive the Holy Spirit in, in the way you need it, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says when you believe, you receive the fullness of the Godhead in Christ Jesus. You receive the fullness of the Spirit. 
But what has to happen now that once we receive this fullness when I give my life to Christ, that's another thing to have that fullness present in my life and to be filled with that fullness. It's kind of like I can have the Holy Spirit resident and him not be president. Does that make sense? He can be on board, but not in charge. And to be filled means literally that I'm giving him charge, that I'm letting him have control. In other words, my preferences are not mine now. They're the Holy Spirit's. What do you want, God? What is your will, God? And as I choose his will over my will, he empowers me to live the life, to be what he's called me to be. It's down to that simple decision process that I'm allowing God's spirit to reign and to lead and to fulfill his will in my heart and life. Now, if you study Acts very clearly, and even in 1 Corinthians and many other places in the New Testament, you'll see that the obvious evidence of being filled with the Spirit is always one thing. You say, well, speaking in tongues. Well, that happens on a couple of occasions. But on every occasion, you always see people speaking and giving witness to Jesus Christ. Every occasion. Not some. Every occasion. Giving witness to the gospel and to the message of the gospel. How do I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Because I will speak the word of God. It's what will come out of my heart and out of my mind. Ephesians tells us this simple principle, you know, that when you receive, when you receive the Holy Spirit is when you receive Christ. Verse one, chapter one, verse 13 says, in him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed on him, then you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Excuse me, when? Is it clear in those words? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you heard the gospel and believed the gospel, what happened? You can read the rest of it. All right. You can look at this in about any English translation, and it pretty much says the same thing in every one of them. When you heard and received and believed, you were sealed. Holy Spirit came into your life. And not just in your life, he's on your life. Literally, it's an, it's an insignia, this seal, like a Roman king or, or, or king of ancient times. They'd have these insignia rings, and they would use those rings and mark a wax seal with it to show their, their authority on it. And God's saying, listen, my seal in your life is the Holy Spirit. What identifies you with me now is that I'm in you. I live in you. I'm on your life. The signifying mark that I, you belong to me is me in you, all right? This is what we would use if you're going to get theological in terminology. You know, this is what it really means to, to know Christ. I've been redeemed and saved, and the Holy Spirit now lives in my life. Now, the Bible tells me one thing now. Now that I am in Christ, I should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, excess, it says in King James. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what he tells me. You say, you have the Holy Spirit, yes, but now I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you look at this in a, in, a, in a Greek dictionary and look at this word to be, it is an active word in the present tense active word, which means we could translate it more appropriately and be ye always being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an active thing in my life. It's a day by day thing. If I was filled with the Spirit yesterday, that was good for yesterday. I need to be filled with the Spirit today. Now, how can I be filled with the Spirit? Well, I have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, so I need to let the fullness fill me. And there's a lot of verses that just deal with that very simple principle. You have God, now let him fill you. Jesus is your Lord, now let him be Lord, all right? He's ready in your life. He's there in your life. Let him be present in your life. Let him be present in your life. Let him be in charge of your life. We, we, by the way, how do you get drunk? No volunteers, please. You get drunk by taking drinks, right? You start drinking and you end up drunk, all right? What, 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 literally, it's, it's a very simple term about drinking and eating in the New Testament. It's always symbolic of faith and believing. All right? When the Bible says, Jesus says, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood, what's he saying? You believe on me. It's a commitment, all right, to follow, to surrender, to be identified, to become one with someone else. That you're, you're one with that person now. So if I believe in Jesus, I'm drinking Jesus, all right? If I believe in Jesus, I'm, I'm, it's, it's the bread of my life. I'm, I'm eating Jesus, and he's my life. Now, that's one thing now that I've received him, but now he says I want you to be filled with him so that he literally in charge of your life. So I can say honestly, I've been baptized, I've experienced the baptism by Jesus, you know, with the Holy Spirit because I got saved. What happened when I got saved? Jesus took me and sealed me with his Holy Spirit. He placed me, the Bible says in Romans 6, into the body of Christ, for we have all been baptized into one body, right? That's the Spirit. Now, he doesn't say some of us 
have been baptized, all of us that are believers, right? For we have all been baptized, not some of us. And I love when he writes to the Corinthian church about these issues. People say, well, you know, this will be like the Corinthian. The Corinthian church is probably the most carnal church in the New Testament. And he's telling those people, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he just told them, if some of you, you know, you're acting, your behavior's wrong, you're immoral, you're immoral your attitudes are right, you're, you, you're, you're full of criticism, you're full of bitterness, you won't forgive one another. And he just goes down this list. They were people who had the Holy Spirit, but weren't being controlled by the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now live like that. Let the Holy Spirit live through you. Be filled today. He's in your life. Let him take charge of your life. Now, if there's anybody I think that wouldn't qualify for that would be the, those Corinthians because their actions were so ungodly and so immoral even at times. You just look at them and say, what is wrong with these people? What was wrong with them is they'd been filled, they'd been baptized, they'd had the fullness of God in them, but they weren't living it. They weren't growing. He said, you, you, said, you should have grown. He said, you're still carnal. They weren't growing in Christ. They weren't letting God control their lives. But it's the will of God that God control our life, not just save us. But he wants to use us in this world. And so he, he works with us and he gives us what we need, praise the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit from God. The baptism of the Spirit is the initial experience of every believer. John 3, here's the words of Jesus. He answered, said, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Here's Jesus giving an introductory lesson to what it meant to be born anew and have new life. John 3 is that great passage dealing with that. This is about nine verses before he tells Nicodemus, you know, you must be born again. And he's explaining that as he's coming up to that, say, hey, there's a new life and it's a spiritual life and it requires the spirit to have that spiritual life. And when you receive that new life, you receive the spirit. So what happened when you give your life to Christ? Now, one guy said, well, you receive Jesus, but you don't receive the Spirit. I said, what have you been drinking? I mean, that's not possible. It's not possible to receive Jesus and not receive the Spirit. Because Jesus comes into our life by the means of the Holy Spirit. All right? In Acts, when, when Paul is, when Peter is preaching to the, those who are gathered, they said, he said, listen, everybody's been broken about their sins. He said, repent and be baptized. Uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? When you repent and receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. So for anybody to come to you and say, listen, I know you're saved, but you haven't received the Spirit yet, they really don't know what the Bible teaches. You know, and it's really a matter of, I'm not stupidity, it's just a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of really taking the Word of God as a whole from everything Jesus says to the Apostle says to John says and seeing what the Scripture has to say about what it means to have the Holy Spirit. That when I gave my life to Christ, I received the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, catch this. You're not in the flesh anymore. Once you give your life to Jesus, you're now a spiritual being. You're in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God does what? in you. And if you do not have the spirit of Christ, you're not a Christian. You don't belong to him. In other words, you can't be a Christian without the spirit. Now, at this point, one of my friends early on in my Christian life said, but Joe, Joe, that's the spirit of Christ. That's not the Holy Spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. There's not two spirits. Jesus doesn't have his, and I know Benny Hinn tried to peel this off from one of his books and they had to call his book back and reprint it. That, that each person in the Godhead had their own trinity. You know, and that's what they had. They tried to take this verse and explain it away. Well, Jesus has a spirit, you know, and, and he's got the Father and he's got his own son and then the Holy Spirit has a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and then, a, and then the Father has a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's as stupid as it sounds, right? <laughs> now, that isn't ignorance. That's just too pure stupidity there, Okay. <laughs> When you give your life to Christ, you receive the Spirit. Now think about that for a moment. That's, that's not a, a simile, a metaphor. It's not allegorical. That's reality. That ought to cause you to praise God. That means you got what you need. You have Christ in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. But now we need to let the Holy Spirit get a hold of our lives and take charge in our lives and work in our lives. That's where that point about being filled with the Holy Spirit comes. Remember who's that, that most carnal church in, in the New Testament? The Corinthians. And what did he tell them? Don't you know you're, you're the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. 
The Spirit of God lives in you. He goes on and tells us in 1 Corinthians, that for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether you're Jew or Greek, a slave or free, you were all made to drink from one spirit. So you see very clearly, there's just one spirit. How many spirits? There's not a spirit of the spirit and the spirit of Christ. There's just one spirit. And what happened when I believe, I receive. I'm baptized into one body. I know there's a popular theology and it's here on the radio and everywhere. Well, you need to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's even bad terminology. You don't even see that terminology in the Bible. You see baptism of Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer, not the Holy Spirit, right? Who's the baptizer? When he comes, John said, he will baptize you. I'm baptizing you with water. He's going to baptize you with spirit and fire. So there's one baptizer who uses the means of the Holy Spirit to place us into the body of Christ, wherein we receive God's fullness. The moment I receive Christ, I become a Christian in Christ's body at that moment. So I now, as, as the scriptures tell me, I've been placed in him. And guess what? He's been placed in me, one spirit, and now I'm one with God. All right? So what I'm trying to say here, if I'm really going to be ready, I have to be a believer in Christ. Now I have the spirit on board, but now I need to let the spirit of God fill my life. And this was the message to the Corinthian church and to the Galatian church. You guys need to let the Holy Spirit take charge in your life and fill your life. And the obvious occurrence of that will be a changed life, will be seen by other people, but will also be heard by other people. You will speak. That's why Jesus said, listen, when you, when you receive, then you're going to be my witnesses. What happens when we receive the Spirit? He says, then you'll be my witnesses. There's a lot of people tell you a lot of different things will happen when you receive the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what always happens when you receive the Holy Spirit is you're going to be a witness of Christ. It's not, this, this issue of receiving the Spirit is not, it's not a post-conversion experience that's just accompanied by a particular gift. When I get saved, the Spirit comes in and He gives me the gifts as He will, not as I tell you what they are. It's not some man's job to tell you, hey, you receive the Spirit and this is what will happen to you. No, God determines that. He determines the gifts we receive, not man, not a denomination, not a board, all right? Jesus determines what gifts he'll give. I don't get to determine that. But I want this gift, or I want that gift, or I'm going to pray like I get this gift. That, sorry, not the way it works. Sovereign God is in charge of our lives. My body is now his temple. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, All these work that one, the same self-spirit, will divide to every man gifts as he chooses or he wills. But I can tell you, if I'm filled with the Spirit, there will be changes, and there will be actions and there's one thing that he will give to every person who receives his Holy Spirit. What is it? It's a witness, a testimony of a changed life. He loves the world, and he's empowered us to carry out that ultimate mission. To be filled now with his Holy Spirit means that I'll let him have charge in my life. And if you follow the scriptures and you follow the New Testament carefully, you'll see that in every instance, such as in Acts chapter 4, when they received the Holy Spirit, that something unique happened to that group of people, as it will today when we individually or even corporately pray. What happens when, we receive, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit? It says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. Do you catch that? What happens when you're filled? You speak the Word of God with boldness. Now, these people have already been at Pentecost. These was, this was the Jerusalem church, all right? These the, that's who this people is. Two chapters later, it's the same folks that have just witnessed the baptism of God's Spirit. What happened there on the day of Pentecost? The church was formed. New Testament salvation took place in the fullest sense. All those things that Jeremiah talked about with the covenant, all those things that David had prophesied, all those prophecies of old about a new heart, a new life, that God write his law upon your heart, that was all foretelling what would take place on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God would come and inhabit all men who would believe and form the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what took place that day. Now, we're part of that same thing. So everybody who comes since Pentecost gives their heart and life to Jesus. Jesus comes in, saves them, seals them, and puts his Holy Spirit in them. Now it's our responsibility to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, Amen. to respond, to obey, to receive, to yield daily, and to be filled. You know, what I've discovered about being filled with anything is usually whatever you're full of comes out your mouth. 
I'll let you put that in whatever context it goes to. But isn't that true? Whatever you're full of is what's going to come out of your mouth. If all you want to talk about is boys, guess what comes out of your mouth? If all you talk about is girls, what comes out of your mouth? What's in your heart? What, 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 what's, your, what's your big enthusiasm? What's your big excitement? Some people it's sports, some people it's money, some people it's popularity. It's, it's all these different things. You know what happens when you get really filled with Jesus? What comes out of your mouth? You guys are getting smarter every day. That's why I tell you you should go to Church of Believers Fellowship. <laughs> Amen. What comes out your mouth is Jesus. That's what's going to fill your heart. It fills your mouth. And when we're full of Jesus, you know what comes out? Well, if we're religious and that's what we're full of, you know what comes out of our mouth? Criticism. Arrogance. Pride. Complaining. But what happens when we're filled with the Spirit that, that lives in us fully? What happens then? What comes out of our life is love and grace, encouragement, ministry, truth, boldness. So when Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel, where did that prothumos, that enthusiasm, that excitement, that unction come from? The Holy Spirit who lives in us. The same Holy Spirit that lived in Paul lives in you and lives in me. The same Holy Spirit from our Heavenly Father that is one with Christ and one with the Father now lives in you. I told you when I first got saved and began to understand these principles, I wrote a little tract to hand out to people called I've Been, in, I've been Invaded by an Alien Being. <laughs> because it is alien to me. Until I come to Jesus, then it's no longer alien. Amen. And now, guess what? I'm alien to the world. They don't get it. Why? Because we are so unique and so different. I am ready to preach the gospel, for I am not, what's that word? I'm not ashamed. That's my regard now. That's my, what I respect, what I give regard to, what, get, what you guys are, it's the gospel now that we're not ashamed of. It's Christ. Can you imagine, just think for a moment, all that Jesus did for you. He, he suffered According to the Bible, the most humiliating death anybody could ever suffer, death on a cross. But not just dying on a cross. He was stripped. He was humiliated. He was beaten. Because he took regard to you and me. Because he regarded us. Because he loved us. He considered us before himself. That's, and he wasn't ashamed to be ashamed there. I think so many times we're, we're letting this world and the way, of its, the way it moves and the way it acts shape our thoughts and our thinking and our attitudes and our philosophy about life instead of letting the Spirit of God generate his biblical view in us of compassion and concern and heartbrokenness so that we're not ashamed what the world says. We don't care anymore. Right? Because we care about what God says. We care about what God's will is. We care about what God desires. So we're not going to let these things dictate to, us the, dictate to us the way we're going to live our life. We're going to live our lives for the glory of God. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I think sometimes people are ashamed to the gospel. Amen. There's a passage in Hebrews. When we go through the, what we call the, the list of heroes of Hebrews chapter 11, you see all these great people of faith, these men of faith, these women of faith, these young people of faith. And, if, and if God goes through this list as he gets the, towards the latter part of that chapter. He says, and in whom, talking about all those people, that God was not ashamed to be called their God. It's kind of like, those are my kids. You know, have you ever had that with your children? Ah, that's my kid. Some of you have had that other experience too. Oh, I don't know whose kids those are. Or your wife says, take care of your kids. <laughs> all of a sudden, they're your kids or her kids, right? I want to be one of those listed in Hebrews 11. God says, that's one of mine. That's one of mine. Look the way they're living their life. Look the, way they're, look, the way they, look the way they have a burden for the lost. That's my heart they're living with. Look the way they're speaking up, unashamed. But we're so afraid of being so politically incorrect, it is poisoning the well at the church and the life of the church. When pastors sell, buy into that mindset, it corrupts the message of the gospel. You know? Don't be afraid of the truth. Don't be ashamed of the truth. 
Yes, the more that we stand for Christ, the rest of the world will look upon you as politically incorrect and as a corrupt individual. There are people even this last week that I heard in media circles talking about Christians and their commitment and their stand for morality and standards of morality. Well, those people are just full of evil. Those Christians are just full of evil. They just, they just evil people. They're wicked people. And you know why they classified these particular people as wicked and evil people? Because they had a, a moral conviction about homosexuality. They believed the Bible says that is a lifestyle, that is a choice, that is sinful. All right? You made a decision to live in such a way that God says don't live in. God doesn't condone it. And God says it's a shameful way to live your life. And so for me to embrace what God's word has said and what God has clearly stated in Scripture, now I'm wicked and now I'm evil? Just because I have a moral standard? The Bible tells us that you will know when that last generation is alive on the planet because they will call evil good and good evil. And that's certainly where we are, is it not? So I'll take it, man. Call me whatever you want. Just don't call me late for supper, right? <laughs> call me whatever you will. But I want to know one thing. What does God call me? Is he ashamed of me? I don't want to be ashamed of him. Here's the words of Jesus. Whoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I'll leave that up for a moment. It's a powerful word, isn't it? Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, I'm not confessing you before my Father. You want me to be, stand in honor of you, but you won't stand in honor of me. You won't tell others about me. You won't let a lost world know. You won't confess me before others. Why should I confess you before my Father? Because your lack of willingness to stand up for Christ, your lack of your willingness to stand up for Jesus, your lack of willingness to speak the gospel shows where the heart is, does it not? Well, at this point, this is when you say, oh, that one hurt. <laughs> and come back to the Father and say, God, I cannot believe that I've gotten myself to this place where I would be ashamed of you. In lieu and in light of all you've done for me, how in the world did I get to this place in my life? That's the honesty that it's required. But it requires honesty and it requires humility. But if we fail there, we fail all the way across the board, do we not? Don't be ashamed of Christ. That's why, you know, that's why most churches don't even give invitations anymore. You don't see public altar calls in many churches anymore. Oh, that's just something. And, and I hear all the reasons why your pastors don't do it. I've sat down and discussed with all of them. Well, you know, that's a private thing that people need to resolve. It is a private. It's the most private thing you'll ever do. It takes place in your heart. Nobody sees in there but you and God. But it is a private decision that results in a public declaration. He said, for with a heart a man believes unto righteousness, but with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we give invitations at Believer's Fellowship because we want to give people an opportunity to make that confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. We give invitations at Believer's Fellowship because we want to give people a platform that when the truth is spoken, they can respond there and in that moment to whatever the Holy Spirit's saying to them. Or they find someone who will pray with them or help them or counsel them or minister. That's what we're here for. But if we're just so afraid of letting the rest of the world know that I have a need, then I'm never going to get my needs met. Amen? Amen? So we'll give the opportunity for people to respond. And especially, I believe, that when Christians need a revival in their life, we need to give them a platform to come and just fall on the face before the Lord and get right with God. Yes, we can do it in our homes, but tell you what, usually when we leave here, how many, how many times have you sat through an invitation, you said, I'll take care of this at home, and we're still waiting for that, Right? just something that seals it in our own heart and mind. Let's be obedient to our Heavenly Father. These are great days. There's a tremendous opportunity. It's in those moments, the greatest, darkest hours in American history, when the first and second great awakening took. It was in the moments of 1960s. Y'all remember those years? Some of you are old enough at least. When the, when, the, when the moral climate of this world was at the lowest it had ever been in America. They were announcing on Time Magazine, no picture, just said, God is dead. On the walls of Texas University, somebody wrote up a big sign and signed it in Nietzsche. It says, God is dead. 
All across the America, they were telling us how God was dead. Free sex, immorality everywhere, drunkenness, and the drug revolution had sprung forth. But in the early 70s, just about the time they were ready to kick the dirt on Jesus' grave again and say he's dead, there was a little revival that took place. And some of you in this room is a result of that revival called the Jesus Revolution. People got saved. People like me got saved that time. We're back in one of those dark, dark, deep places in American history, which means don't believe the world when people tell the church, people don't want to care. They don't care about that anymore. Or they don't want to hear you. Or they don't care about the message of the gospel. Or they don't want to hear about Jesus. Or they don't want to go to church. Hey, that's true. But let me tell you, it's in those moments that we should shine the brightest. And it's in those moments that God's going to do the greatest moves. So I'm ready for God to do something big. How about you? Get on board with his will and his purposes. God will do something with your life that will shock even you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to you. We ask you to take this word.